Hi, everyone. Hi, welcome to our Facebook Live today on data collection strategies. So this is a question that we get asked a lot, and we know a lot of people are curious about how to collect data, what role it plays in our programming, how to choose which data collection to use. So we wanted to open the conversation and feel free to go ahead and um, ask your questions and interact and let's start the conversation. So I think the, the most important question to ask as you're starting your data collection procedure is what do you what do you want the data for so you know a lot of the time we always ask well why data collection obviously we're bcbas we need data that's what we've been taught um, but really what it comes down to is what do we need to know period so i want to collect data on a problem behavior because that's what i've been told to do in school my first question shouldn't be how do i do it my first question should be what why why do i want to collect data on this problem behavior and what do i need to know so you know i might need to know obviously the function, but I might need to know, you know, is it occurring more in one program or another program? Is it occurring more at a certain time of the day? Is it occurring more with one therapist versus another therapist or one teacher versus another teacher? So those might be some of the things that I want to know. Um, so obviously, you know, you need to define behavior, et cetera, et cetera. But then based on the answers to those questions of what do you need to know, you know, you can either take data re um, on a frequency graph, so frequency of occurrence or frequency of occurrence per program or frequency of occurrence per period per time of day um, divide your time of you know divide your day into times of day before lunch after lunch etc um, you may want to record duration not duration of overall behavior but duration of each frequency so you know one tantrum was only 30 seconds the next tantrum was 10 minutes the next tantrum was 20 minutes etc might be another way to do it so frequency duration um, lots of people you know throw an ABC chart ABC chart we absolutely use an ABC chart but we don't use it for very long so we'll use it for the first few days just to see if there's a pattern of behavior and then we'll jump to okay let's do an FBA and then let's do you know let's look at you know when these things are occurring uh, and I think in choosing which data collection you do in terms of behavior data so if there is a negative behavior that you need to collect data on first of all the data you're collecting at first is going to tell you what type of intervention in terms of a functional analysis so it has to give you that kind of information and then the data collection might change after you have created an intervention to tell you if the intervention is working or not. So it's okay to kind of switch. So at first you might be collecting ABC data to get an idea about the function. Um, you, If it's happening a lot, then ABC data might not be as effective. So if it's happening less frequent, go ahead and take ABC data, get some insight about the function. If it's something that's happening really, really frequently or lasting a really long time, you might wanna look at something more like frequency duration or partial interval recording data. And that would give you more information so partial interval behavior data would be dividing your day up into periods. So whether it be a one minute or a two minute or a three minute period, and then collecting data on time of day, when does it occur? And you can definitely see that in partial interval. And the nice thing about partial interval recording is that if there is a behavior that happens really often, it would give you information on both the frequency and the duration. So it would tell you that, you know, if you had a meltdown that lasted two seconds, um, well, one minute, depending on what your interval is, um, or, and it would also tell you if it lasted 10 minutes. So it would give you how many times he had a meltdown and also how long those meltdowns lasted. If they're really not happening that often, then again, ABC data would give you some good information as well. And you can include duration on ABC data, just having there be another place for the therapist or the teacher or the parent to fill in the duration. So you want to think about what you want to know about the behavior. Do you want to know about the setting? Do you want to know how long it's lasting? Do you want to know what the triggers are? Do you want to know um, like what's happening after? So thinking about the information that's going to be helpful for you in figuring out this behavior and then choosing that data collection. And then going forward, once you've started the intervention, you can do something maybe a little bit more simple because you're just looking to see if the intervention is working. So you could just continue to take frequency, continue to take partial interval recording. Again, you're making an assumption about the function, so you may not need ABC data anymore. Um, and that that would be the, the behavior type of data. In terms of all these graphs, all of these graphs are on our behavior resource page. So if you click on behavior resource and click on the behavior section in that, we've got all our graphs posted there. So we've got a couple different examples of ABC charts. We've got some frequency 
chart are with frequency graphs and duration graphs, as well as partial and whole interval recording. So check it out there um, if you've got any questions about that. Now, Shira, what about skill acquisition? Right, so that's almost another type of data collection. So we have data that tells us about behavior, and that's gonna tell us about function, gonna tell us if our intervention is working, and um, it's gonna give us insight into why the behavior is happening. But then there's a whole part of what we do that is learning the skill, right? So with every behavior we're decreasing, we should also be teaching a skill. So there's a lot to cover in terms of skill acquisition and data collection. Um, and again, it really depends on what you want the information to tell you and what the skill is that you're teaching. So if you're looking at more of like a tabletop type program where you're doing some DTT, you're doing some trial by trial stuff, then you might take per opportunity data. So you might get a percentage, you know, you might run 10 trials and you're giving them a percent that they got correct out of 10. So then you get 80%, 70%. And it's pretty simple to then set like mastery criteria because you could say, well, they need to reach 80% over two days. And that's a pretty straightforward type of per opportunity data for skill acquisition. Um, sometimes if we have a learner who can learn pretty quickly and maybe learns through some really good teaching, we might, we might put in something called probe data. So we would just test, uh, take data on the first time that we've presented that SD or that material, and then just continue to teach it. So if they get it wrong, continue to teach it. If they get it right, we'd move them on. And that we would use somewhat of like a yes, no data sheet, and that would be called like probe data. So one of my biggest frustrations is when I see a therapist getting caught up in data. Now, yes, we're all BCBAs, you know, or RBTs. We, we know we need to take data. But again, coming back to what do we want to know? And it bothers me when I see a therapist who's doing really, really great data collection, but doesn't spend the time teaching. So it's all about, I've got to get my data. I've got to get my data. So we really try and make data collection as easy as possible. You can see on our website, we've got a ton of different uh, graphs and, you know, yes, no strategies, all of that type of thing. But really what we want to encourage our therapists is throw your pen down or throw your pencil down and teach you know what does good teaching look like and really train your staff in terms of what good teaching looks like here's here's what we do we're teaching we're teaching and we can catch the data up later so we we're not faking data we're teaching and then you know we take can take probe data so maybe we just take a yes no trial by you know yes no data or we do trial and then we teach and then we do another trial where you take data and then you teach a bit more etc so you can you can play around with your data collection. You can almost model your data collection to your learners and also probably to your therapists, right? Mm -hmm. You know, we all probably have a variety of different types of therapists or teachers. So, you know, we've got some teachers who are really, really good at teaching, but really weak in data collection. So making their data collection really straightforward is great. And then we've got some therapists who, you know, really want to see trends and, 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 and are able to teach and do both and multitask, et cetera. So the biggest thing is, wanting to for those people you know finding a data collection system that works for them and maybe theirs is a little bit more cumbersome but at the same time like i don't like cumbersome i don't i don't throw your pencil down and teach and one of the best feedbacks that we get is something that we do and we share with our program descriptions and data collection strategies is we put all of our programs into some sort of like a daily data sheet so that the therapist doesn't have to be like flipping through the binder through their entire session. So everything is kind of on a one pager that would last them about a week and they could record all their data there and at the end of the session transfer it into the binder onto the graph or whatever. Um, and one of the best feedbacks that we get from therapists is like, wow, I love not having to have the binder on my lap because it's so annoying to have to like flip through the binder and know which program to go to. Um, so creating a way to collect the data where it's not all about the binder and it doesn't take over the session, but it enables the therapist to continue to do the teaching while still making effective data decisions is a great balance to try and find. Now on the behavior resource, if you've been on it, you'll also see that we've got some rating scale data sheets. So rating scale data sheets would be okay on a scale of one to five or zero to five, how did the student do today? Now, when would you use those, Shira? So those are really great for times where you really want the therapist to be more engaged than running trials. So if you're doing something like net teaching, if they're working with a very early like beginner learner, you want them to spend their time pairing, to spend their time engaging with the child, to play. It's very hard to run play and also be taking trial by trial data because it's just not possible um, to be focused 
as focused as you need to be on the child. So we might set up a rating scale data sheet on skills like how engaged was the child, um, how much was he willing to let you in their space, how much was he commenting throughout your play. So those kind of things we'd give them like a rating scale based on how much prompting they needed to get those done. Now, some of the feedback we get on that from therapists is, wow, I really love this because it enables me to throw my pencil down and teach. Um, and other feedback we get is, wow, isn't that really subjective? And absolutely, I'm the first person to say that it's pretty subjective. Uh, I think what it comes down to is a rating scale is a little bit better than yes, no, because you've got like a yes, no sometimes. Um, but also a rating scale is, it can be subjective, but, you know, uh, one, which means like he's not really able to do it, and a five is a five, period, is pretty conclusive. So yes, you have to recognize when using rating scale data that it can be subjective, but it's better than no data. Right. Also, sometimes choosing the data collection is a way to remind the therapist or to encourage the therapist to be running the program a certain way. So if everything is probe data, I find that sometimes therapists don't run it as much because they just do it once and they forget that they have to continue to teach or continue to run it. So sometimes t putting in a certain data collection on the skill acquisition is a way to remind the therapist that you need to do this 10 times, 20 times, or however many times you think that the child needs it. So that's also something to consider that the data is not just how well the child did, but how much teaching is the therapist remembering to do with the child. Um, so those are kind of net versus tabletop data collection styles. Um, there's also manding data. So maybe we could talk about that one. So manning data, I always think clicker. The first thing I think of is, okay, how many clickers can I use at the same time? Because I really want to be able to take data on, um, you know, prompted versus unprompted man. Some people throw in a third clicker and, and differentiate between unprompted and spontaneous. I don't know about everybody else, but I can multitask to a certain extent. But when you give me clickers, I can't manage more than two at a time. I just, I can't. You know, I can color code them because you can you know, by colored clickers. I just, I can't do it, Shira. <laughs> so typically what we do is we define what a mand is. So a mand might be any verbal response. A mand may be, no, it needs to be a phrase or it needs to be these three specific phrases. Or it needs to be an appropriate protest defined as blah, blah, blah. Or it needs to be a WH man.